want to welcome you to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center virtual field trip. We want to say a very special welcome to Bethune, Nathan Adams, Withers, Maple Lawn, all of Dallas ISD, and Purifoy from Frisco ISD. Thank you guys for joining us this morning. We hope you enjoy it and learn. Uh, teachers, if you're watching, you have not signed up, please go to www.tiny.cc slash three dash five registration and sign up for us, please. Program this morning will be soil formation. During this virtual field trip, students will explore how soils are formed by weathering a rock and decomposition of plants and animal remains. Weathering a rock by Mr. Monroe, decomposition of plants and animals by Ms. Ramirez, compost bins by Mr. Dominguez, animals in soil by Mr. Miss Schramm. Uh, during this program, you cannot ask us a verbal question, but you can go to www.tiny.cc slash question space answer and fill out a question, send it to us. We'll do our best to answer them and uh, it's, it, it, during the program. Now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Mr. Monroe is going to tell you all about weathering of rocks. Students, my name is Mr. Monroe, and <clears throat> my time with you, we're going to be investigating the process that we call weathering of rocks. Now that process weathering is what we call an earth process. We know that the planet earth, especially the surface of our planet, goes through a variety of changes geologically. Weathering is one of those processes. So what I'm going to do is present a short PowerPoint to you all. At the end of that PowerPoint, I'm going to do a couple of lab activities and hopefully by the end, you will know what physical weathering is and you will know what chemical weathering is. So bear with me just for a moment while I share my screen with you and we will get started. It'll take a while to load, but we'll get there. Surface processes. Now, weathering occurs on the surface or close to the surface. Of course, you see a couple of other earth processes there like erosion and deposition, and that will be some agents that you probably will learn a little bit about it later on this school year. Now, hopefully you know how rocks are formed. And you will feel, find out through this presentation how they are broken down. So let's get started. Well, in this image, you see a hammer, you see it raining. So, you know, rocks are exposed to everything that is happening on the surface of our planet. Weathering is the physical and chemical breakdown of rocks at or near the surface. Types of weathering is physical weathering, and what that means is it's the mechanical or physical breakdown of rock into smaller pieces that we call sediments without a change in the minerals chemical composition. What that means is not changing what the minerals that are making up that rock are. Now, there are several ways that rocks can be broken up naturally and physically. Frost action is when water freezes in a crack of a rock surface, expanding and splitting the rock. Now, you know, evidently, uh, <clears throat> I've experienced this myself. I don't know whether you have, but putting a soda in the freezer and wanting it to get cold real quick and sometimes forgetting that you put it in there, well, the liquid that's inside that soda can, as it freezes, what does it do? it expands and if you don't get it out of there in time what's going to happen to that can of soda <clears throat> it's going to split or it's going to explode so freeze action causes an expansion that will cause the rocks to break apart as in the images that you see here now alternate freezing and thawing forms potholes and frost heat students last year when we got that tremendous freeze you know, it was cold for so long. Our roads had already started turning bad with potholes, but it even got worse because of 
that freezing point that we had been holding at for a long period of time, and then it warmed up and it created what? More potholes, making the roads that we travel even rougher. You know, plants and animals, oh man, they can cause rocks to break apart. Plant roots force their way into cracks. Animals uncover rock and expose it to the elements that are happening on the surface here. You know, you will always see, I don't know whether you always will see, but I've always noticed how plants will grow right through a crack, causing that crack to expand. And you know what? Those plants need sunlight, right? Well, they are not going to be denied that valuable sunlight that they use in the process of photosynthesis to make their own food. So they're going to grow right through that crack. And as they grow bigger, the crack that they're growing through is also going to get bigger. Exfoliation dome. Layers of rock peel off the main body of the rock as in this image from Casper, Wyoming. And here. You know, temperature changes, alternating hot and cold temperatures weaken the rock as it expands and contracts. And we see a lot of that happening in certain parts of Texas. Abrasion, pieces of rock collide with each other due to transportation by wind, ice, water, and gravity. So abrasion is another way that rocks are physically broken down. Water and wind are the primary agents for that to be happening. And then we have what we call chemical weather. The process by which chemicals break down rock through a change in the mineral's composition happens fastest in a hot, moist climate. And we see that happening in big parts of our home state, the state of Texas. Take, for example, if you lay a nail out in the uh, elements, we know that nails have a iron mineral that makes up most of that content of that iron, iron piece. And if it's exposed to a little bit of moisture, a little bit of oxygen, you will see that nail turn rusty color. That is a perfect example of oxidation, chemical weathering. It occurs when oxygen from the air combines with iron-rich minerals of the rock and creates what we call rust. Carbonation occurs when water combines with carbon dioxide in the air to form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid easily dissolves rocks like limestone and marble. Here we have a cavern, and this cavern was created by carbonation. The caverns that are located down around San Antonio, guess how they were created? They were not man, <coughs> excuse me, they were not man-made, <coughs> but they were created through carbonation. Now I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and we're going to get into those little lab activities that I've got prepared for you guys. So bear with me. All right. Now, a good example of physical weathering, so you'll know, is that I'm going to use some chalk. And I'm going to use a scientific, a couple of pieces of scientific equipment called a pistol and a mortar. Inside the mortar, I have a piece of chalk. Now that piece of chalk actually is representing dolomite limestone, which is very common in this part of Texas. In fact, there is a line of deposits that run right through Dallas, all the way down pretty close, the San Antonio, Texas, and it's underneath the surface. So I'm going to show you an example of physical weathering. I'm going to take the pistol and I'm going to crush and I'm going to grind that chalk up, that limestone. And if we look at that, we've got bits and pieces. Now, the size and the shape of the chalk has changed, but we've got little crumbs and little pieces of that chalk. Now, is it still the same material? Yes, it's still chalk, but it has changed its shape. 
So this is an example of physical weather. On the other hand, I have a piece of that dolomite limestone and I'm gonna put it in this little box here. And then I'm going to use a substance and it's supposed to be a, uh, not weak carbonic acid, but it is carbonic acid. And if you were here with me today, I would have you examine this substance by maybe using some of your observations. You know, you would look at it and you think, oh, it's water. But then on the other hand, you would new, use another one of your senses, then that is a sense of smell, trying to figure out what this is. Now, since you don't know what it is, you would not, oh, to be safe, you would not stick that right up to your nose and smell it, especially if you're in a lab because it might be something that would be toxic to you because of the odor, okay? So to be on the safe side, what you would do if you were here with me doing this lab activity, you would wrap it. And what we mean by wrapping, you would fan the smell up to you. Not getting a direct inhalant of the, the chemical, but just a little whiff of it, okay? And I can tell you, it smells kind of bad. And I could tell you, if you were here doing this with me, I bet you guys would be able to tell me what the substance is. It's vinegar, and it is a carbonic acid. So let's see what happens if I pour enough carbonic acid in to cover the chalk or the dolomite limestone. Now, what I'm observing, and I don't know whether you can see it, but there is some fizzing going on. That piece of dolomite limestone is dissolving. Now, it's fizzing. It's making bubbles. So what does that tell us that's going on there? There is a change going on. And we're creating a new substance in there. So this is an example of a chemical weathering process. Now, the bubbles are indicating that a gas is being given off. Do you know what that gas is? Since we're using carbonic acid and we're using limestone, the gas that is being given off is carbon dioxide. Wow. So this is an example of chemical weathering. And believe it or not, you guys saw the cavern that, that was there in the last image that I showed you. Even this gigantic rock that I have here, it has all these weird looking holes in it. Guess how those holes got there? This huge rock laid out in the elements, raining. And the rain that was falling, guess what? Do we have carbon dioxide in the air? Yes. When carbon dioxide mixes with water, guess what happens? That water becomes a very weak carbonic acid and that carbonic acid over years fell on this rock and there were deposits of dolomite limestone in these areas where you see the hole. So what happened is that the limestone was dissolved and it left these holes. And that's how the caverns that are located down by San Antonio, that's how those caverns were developed. That's how they were made. Well, hopefully I've given you a good understanding about what physical weathering is and what chemical weathering is. And right now I'm out of time. So what I'm gonna have to do is turn it back over to Dr. Gorman. So if any of you have any questions, I bet he can answer those for you. You guys have a good day and enjoy the rest of your virtual field trip with us. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. Uh, we did have a question, a request to describe uh, weathering of rocks. Weathering describes the breaking down or dissolving of rocks and minerals on the surface of the earth. Water, ice, acids, salts, plants, animals, and changes in temperature are all agents of weathering. Once a rock has been broken down, a process called erosion transports the bits of rock and mineral away. And now Ms. Ramirez is gonna tell you about decomposition of plants and animals. 
Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez, and in this segment, we're going to be learning about the role of decomposition in the formation of soil. So with Mr. Monroe, you learned about weathering, which is the breakdown of rock. Now we're going to be learning about decomposition, which is the breakdown of dead plant and animal material. So we have rocks and dead plants and animals that make up our soil. So when you guys are outside playing in the dirt, it probably looks something like this. But before it turned into this, it actually looked like this. And so we're going to investigate that process of decomposition, the breakdown of all that dead leaf and branches and animals. We're going to be studying that today. We're also going to be looking at some examples of decomposers. And that word sounds awfully familiar, just like decomposition. So decomposers are simply those animals that break down dead plant and animal material. You guys probably already know some. For example, we have fungi like mushrooms, invertebrates like some insects, and we also have bacteria, that tiny stuff that we can't see. Those are all organisms that break down the dead plants and animals. So I actually have some decomposer friends to show you guys. I'm going to give you a clue to who my first one is, and then I'll let you guys guess. This animal friend has six legs. It is an invertebrate, meaning it has no backbone. It is brown and can camouflage in the brown soil. It has two antennas and three body parts, and it is a great decomposer. Um, it also hisses when it gets scared. Uh, so go ahead and make a guess what animal you think this is. And I'll pull it out. So this one is Bella. She is a Madagascar hissing cockroach. They get that name because they do hiss when they feel scared or threatened. Notice the color. She has excellent camouflage to blend in with the soil. And she is a decomposer. So she helps to break down the dead plant and animal material. So there's our first decomposer. And then while I was walking outside, I actually came across another one and all the leaf litter, and that is a daddy long legs. So when you guys come out here to the environmental center, you probably will see a lot of these guys in our forest, and they are another example of a decomposer. Now to me, decomposers are super important because they help to get rid of all the dead stuff. So when the plants and trees die, when the animals die, those decomposers will help to recycle them and break them down. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you guys, and we will take a look at uh, decomposition here at the Environmental Center. So let me get the screen share started. And since you guys cannot be out here with us today, here's our virtual walk through the forest. We're going to be looking at the decomposition. So decomposition is just the breakdown of plants and animals. We call plants and animals organic matter. Organic matter are just things that were once alive. So we have some leaves, there's some sticks and branches. All of those things are organic matter. Now those are big chunks right now, but over time, those big chunks will break down into smaller pieces with the help of decomposers. And I'm gonna pause it there. So you notice the top layer of the forest had the big pieces of leaves, sticks and branches. When I dug a little further, notice the size change. Now we have smaller pieces that have been broken down even further. And hopefully you guys found another example of a decomposer uh, that I have in my hand in that piece of soil. Hopefully you're able to see that little snail. I found lots of other decomposer friends that day as well, including some worms and some other insects. But eventually all of those pieces will break down into super tiny pieces and help to make up the soil. So soil is actually made out of decaying plant material, decaying animals, and also the rocks that you learned about earlier with Mr. Monroe. And eventually all of that stuff will break down into what you see there. So again, we know that soil is made out of decaying matter, dead plants and animals, and even their waste, as well as rocks and minerals. Now in this next segment, we're gonna look at some remains of dead animals. This is one of my favorite things. It's an owl pellet. So whatever an owl eats that its body can't digest, it will cough it back up in the form of a pellet. So you can see some fur and some bones that I found. Eventually decomposers will break that stuff down too. 
Here we have a crawfish remains that were from a heron pellet. There's a poor little dead crawfish that died when our ponds dried up. We have a dead catfish and a dead carp. Again, all of those little dead animals will eventually break down with the help of decomposers. We have a poor little animal that probably got eaten by a predator. Again, its remains will return to the earth. Here we have um, a dead cow, the remains of its body. So vultures end up taking most of the flesh of it. And then what's left, the smaller decomposers will break down. Now, animals release waste, we all know. And the science word for animal poop is scat. And we see a lot of scat out here. Eventually, that scat will also break down and help to form our soil. And here's some coyote scat with some ants crawling around it. You see some big persimmon seeds. We also have some cow patties or cow poop. Eventually, that poop will break down too. We have some more coyote scat with our decomposer friends, the roly polies that are helping to break it down. And then we also have more decomposers in the form of fungi. So we have some interesting mushrooms and fungi out here. I love looking at the different colors, shapes, and textures of these various fungi and mushrooms. They are also helping to break down all the dead leaf litter. Now, if we didn't have decomposers, all of those dead leaves that you guys see uh, would just pile up and stay there forever. So decomposers really do help to get rid of all the dead stuff. Here's an interesting fungi. This is turkey tail fungus. It gets the name because it looks like a turkey's tail. And we have a ton of that out here. We have a decaying log. Again, decomposers are helping to break that log down. Hopefully you saw that snail earlier. And again, without the help of our decomposer friends, all of this dead stuff would stay here forever. So we really do need them. Now here's our important takeaway for today. Remember when you're touching soil that we're always washing our hands after touching soil. Remember what soil is made out of. It's made out of dead plant and animal. It's also made out of rocks and minerals and also animal waste. So we always need to wash our hands after touching it. So I'm gonna stop my screen share and I have one last thing for you guys. And it is a challenge or a little investigation that you guys can do at home. So what I did, Halloween just passed and I had a pumpkin at my house and I let my pumpkin stay there and I'm going to watch it decompose or break down. So over time, I'm just going to document how it slowly breaks down. So at home, if you have an apple or a banana or a pumpkin, leave it outside and watch it over the next couple of months and see how it changes. So I'm going to uh, give it back to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions and that's all I have. Thank you, Ms. Ramirez. And we had a student that wanted a brief definition of what happens to decomposing plants or animals. When a plant, animal, or insect dies, the plant, animal, or insect is broken into tiny pieces, and these pieces become part of the soil. This is called decomposition. Bacteria, fungi, and some worms are what break down dead plants, animals, and insects. The bacteria, fungi, and worms are called decomposers. And now, Mr. Dominguez is going to tell us all about compost bins. Hey guys, it's Mr. Dominguez here at the garden section uh, of our wonderful EEC. Uh, and this is where we grow a variety of different crops, tomatoes, cucumbers, collard greens, uh, okra, all kinds of wonderful stuff that we use not only to feed ourselves, but our animals. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about a component that is very important to soil health, especially if you are thinking of starting your own garden at home. Um, it is compost uh, and compost uh, is a wonderful way to not only reduce food waste, but increase the nutrients needed uh, for your plants to thrive. And I'm gonna be talking to you about two types of compost, your more traditional compost uh, and vermicompost. Uh, and I will help you set up your own vermicompost bin, which I think is a really fun project to do at home or maybe even the classroom. 
So we're gonna head back inside and we're gonna get started. I will give you guys a materials list uh, and help you through every step uh, of your vermi compost bin. Let's get started, guys. All right, so compost is the decayed organic material used as plant fertilizer. But today we are going to focus on a special type of compost called vermi compost. And vermi compost is the product of the decomposition process uh, using various species of worms, usually red wigglers, white worms, and other earthworms. Uh, uh, so all you're going to need for your vermi compost bin is, of course, a bin. So, uh, and if you're just starting off, I recommend something in the 12 gallon to 15 gallon uh, range. Um, and then you can move uh, up once you start realizing, hey, I'm going to need more worm castings for my expanding garden. Uh, you are going to need a drill and the drill is simply used for ventilation holes which I have already drilled into my container right so we need those worms to be able to breathe uh, well and it's mostly uh, because you don't want an uh, anaerobic uh, bacterial uh, environment you don't want bacteria uh, especially bad bacteria to take over your bin. So you need ventilation, okay? You are going to need some sort of bedding for your worms to live in. So the bedding uh, will be made up of two things and there, there, there are different options, but what I like to use is coconut core, okay? And it comes dehydrated uh, in bricks. When you add water to this, it, it will expand. So this should be enough for uh, our needs today um, You just need to add water to this and we'll do that in a little bit uh, You're gonna need some sort of uh, Newspaper bedding uh, since I'm a teacher. I have plenty of copy paper that you know, sometimes I don't use or uh, Papers that you know just that we get and I don't want it to go to waste so instead of uh, you can either recycle it or use it for your vermi compost bin, or you can even add it to your compost pile uh, if you wanted to do traditional composting. Uh, but since we're doing vermi composting, this will be perfect for the worms. And the worms actually do eat uh, the newspaper or the copy paper or whatever uh, it is that you chose to use. Uh, and they also eat the coconut core. So they're wonderful creatures, uh, they're decomposers, uh, so you would expect that from uh, our little worms. Now, uh, you will need to order some worms. So this is probably the most expensive part uh, of the entire project um, is getting some red uh, wigglers. So the red wigglers you can order online. Um, I do not recommend uh, getting worms or digging up worms uh, from your backyard or uh, from your school. Uh, because they're part of that environment. Uh, whenever you take something, an organism from an environment, um, uh, you are taking away a part of a food chain. Uh, you are preventing uh, other animals uh, from eating that animal. So you you break a, a chain that is necessary for uh, for the environment to properly function. So we don't want that. We don't want, we don't want to ever take uh, wild animals or the, no matter how small or large they are from the environment. So order your worms online. Uh, I would say start off with a pound. Okay. So first things first, all I'm going to do is I'm going to add my paper to the bin. Like I said, I've already pre-drilled uh, pre the hole, so we don't need to do that. We've already kind of um, skipped that step. So it's a pretty easy, um, a pretty easy setup that we have here. Now I will mention one more thing. Uh, if you ever look up how to do this online, uh, a lot of people will tell you that you're going to need some sort of drainage hole at the bottom. Uh, but if you maintain proper levels uh, of greens in here, uh, and uh, proper levels of browns and browns are things like newspaper cardboard and things like that you're gonna need a 50 50 balance of those two things 
if you keep it balanced and you don't have too much moisture coming from your greens or you know your banana peels you know your cabbages if if you have a good balance of your paper source uh, and your greens uh, so your browns and your greens you won't have a problem where you start getting a buildup of liquid here at the bottom which is something that you don't want uh, because even though uh, worms need a moist environment to to be uh, to properly breathe because uh, they because they breathe through their skin uh, you don't want that because you're going to start getting uh, anaerobic conditions uh, where bad bacteria grow so you don't want that okay so um, I will fast forward a little bit uh, I'm gonna because dehydrating this uh, I'm sorry not dehydrating but hydrating this does take a little bit so uh, I am going to be back with this hydrated so you can see what it looks like after you add water to it. And then finally we'll add our worms uh, and then we'll give them their first meal, which will be some kale that I had left over. All right, so let's get started. Uh, we'll fast forward this uh, process and then we'll show you the end result and what your bin should look like. All right, guys, we're all done. I know it looks a bit messy, but your worms are gonna enjoy their hydrated bedding uh, with the scraps of paper. Uh, in a little bit, I'll go get some greens for them to uh, munch on. Uh, those are the leftover greens that would have just gone in the trash otherwise. Uh, so the whole point of vermicomposting, like I said, is to use uh, these little creatures, our worms, um, to decompose the food waste um, that we would have normally just thrown in the trash. So this is a great way to help out the environment and to supplement uh, your gardens. Uh, in about a month or two, you should be able to see the soil darken. Uh, that will be the worm castings uh, ready to go. Uh, and like I said, uh, if you're successful, if you like this, uh, I welcome you to expand. They will start breeding. Your worms will start breeding. You're going to eventually start getting uh, some more worms. And um, when that happens, you can definitely uh, go a size up um, in bins. So guys, I hope that you guys learned a little something about uh, vermicomposting. And I hope you guys uh, use this uh, to recycle your food waste uh, and to grow your own food uh, with those worm castings. I'll see you guys next time for the next virtual field trip. Thank you, Mr. Dominguez. Question, what is a compost bin? A compost bin is a container in which you place organic waste to turn into compost over time. Some bins are continuous, meaning you can keep adding waste to them while others create batches of compost with a set mix of ingredients you add all at once. Uh, I have some palm trees around my house, and when I plant palm trees, I have to get a very special set of potting soil to go in there. And uh, so, yes, we need uh, certain things to make that uh, type of potting soil. And now, Ms. Shram is going to tell you about animals and soil. Hey, everybody, it's Ms. Shram. So, we are going to be talking about all the little animals that make their homes in soil. So let's do, do, do. All right, here we go. First, there's my little ghost crab. We're gonna talk about him in a second, but I love ghost crabs. It's one of my favorite animals that burrow. So I tried to compile um, some animals that live in soil that you wouldn't necessarily always think of. So I know you learned a lot about worms and like other insects that live in the soil. So we're gonna look at kind of some larger animals, um, still small animals, but not just insects that use the soil. So the four main types of soil that we're gonna talk about is silt, clay, sand, and loam. So silt is fine and powdery. It's often found at the bottom of riverbeds or deposited by moving water. It's smaller pieces than sand, but not as um, small pieces than clay. So it's in between sand and clay as far as particle size and how fine the um, components are. 
Then clay, of course, you've probably used clay in art class. Clay is um, the finest particles. When you add water to it, it clumps together. Of course, clay is used to make pottery. Um, like I said, you may have used it in art class to make little sculptures and such. So that is also clay. Then sand, of course, we all know you think of going to the beach um, or playing in a sandbox and sand has bigger grains. You can feel the grittiness like sandpaper um, and it has tiny little rocks and maybe shells and different things in the sand. And then the fourth type is loam. So loam just means a mixture of um, soil that has maybe some sand, some silt, some plant matter, some animal matter and you might just call it dirt. All right, so let's see a few examples of some animals that live in those different types of soil. So animals that live in silt, we're gonna meet one in just a bit, but like I said, silt is usually deposited in riverbeds or in lakes and ponds. So silt is that really fine stuff, right? It's almost like clay, but not quite. So animals that live in silt often go to the bottom of the river, the lake, the pond, whatever it is, the body of water and lay in that kind of plant matter debris that we call silt. So they burrow in underwater. So animals like frogs and turtles use this to protect themselves in the winter or to hibernate. Then we have animals in clay. So the best um, animal I could find is an armadillo, and that is the small mammal of Texas. So armadillos live in burrows, and you know that our soil here in Texas can contain a lot of sand, a lot of clay. It can be really hard, but luckily armadillos are expert diggers and they burrow. And so they kind of make their little homes underground. Then, like I said, we've got my favorite little ghost crab. So if you ever go to the coast here in Texas, um, I like to spy them at Galveston. So whenever I go to the beach in Galveston, I see tons of these little holes in the sand. And those little holes are from ghost crabs. So if you stay and watch, or if you go when it's getting a little darker out with a grown up, you might see the ghost crabs coming out. And they're called ghost crabs, not because they're haunted, but because they blend in with the sand. So they're almost, this one's got a little yellow, but when you usually see them in real life, they almost blend in perfectly with the sand and they scuttle out and then they scuttle back in their tunnel. So they rely on the sand for their shelter. Then we've got animals that live in the soil. So the loamy soil, just the dirt that we see outside. So this is a picture of a little gopher and he's popping his head out, checking things out. And of course we know a lot of animals like to hibernate in their burrows and they dig and tunnel into the soil to keep them warm and safe over the winter. So one thing I want you to notice about the little gopher is if you look really close at his front, front claws, those claws are really sharp and that is for him to dig. And he uses those little whiskers to tell how much space he has in his tunnel underground um, because of course it's dark under there. So he uses his whiskers for his kind of spatial reasoning and he's got those long claws to help him dig. All right, so enough of the screen share. Let's see some animal examples. So da, 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 boop. All right, let's see. First, I wanted to show you the silt. So I have a sample of silt right here. And like I said earlier, it's a powdery fine um, substrate. So if I mess with it, it kind of feels like if you have helped someone bake in the kitchen um, and you worked in the kitchen and play with flour before, it feels like flour. It's like a little powder. All right, doo -doo -doo. and let's see a critter that lived in this or uh, loves in silt. So I told you a lot of animals like frogs and turtles, animals that live in the ponds or freshwater environments, they go into the silt and hibernate or spend the winter. And this little turtle goes under 
and he is a mud turtle. So he blends in with that little silt and sits at the bottom and rests and spends most of his time underwater. So that's my little mud turtle. Hello, sir. All right, thank you, sir. And then I also have a little crawfish house. So this little tunnel was made by a crawfish. So kind of like how that ghost crab tunnels into the sand and kind of piles up the sand on the sides. This little crawfish house is made of silt and soil, maybe bits of other things like loam. And the crawfish uses this to make a burrow and a little home for protection. And so this is a little one that I got from out here at the environmental center. I have another huge one, but I didn't want to take it out because it was too heavy, so I don't want to break it. All right, let's look at another soil sample. So we got silt down. Then I want to show you the clay. I don't have any um, examples of living friends here that live in the clay, but I do have this clay. And you can see that this part is still a little wet. So it's sticking together. And I can shape it and everything but I won't get distracted because it feels like I'm playing with Play-Doh. So I'm gonna leave that behind. Then let's look at this loamy soil that we have out here at the Environmental Center. So this is a sample of soil that I just dug up outside my classroom. So you can see there's plant matter. You can see there's plants that are still kind of growing. There's plants that have died and dried up. There's little bits of sand, there's little bits of clay because this is our natural Texas soil out here. And so this is an example of loam. There's lots of different things in there in this soil. So a little friend that lives in this loamy soil is my dear friend, Peanut Bunny. So Peanut Bunny is obviously a rabbit and he was found by me um, in a burrow with his mommy and all his brother and sister bunnies. So the mother bunny had gone missing. I couldn't find her anywhere. And sure enough, she had dug a little burrow and made a nice little shelter for Peanut Bunny and all his siblings. So bunnies also rely on the soil. Thank you, Peanut. You're very lovely. All right, my last type of soil I'm gonna show you is sand, my very favorite kind. So you can see there's little shells because shells are just the outside protection of living things that live in the ocean. We've got little pebbles. There's also little bits of leaf litter, maybe some plants from the ocean that dried out. And that is all part of the sand. And it's still fine, but you can see the granules. It's definitely bigger particles than that clay and that silt. So I'm going to show you a few little things from um, my trips to the ocean that I have um, that live in the sand. So this is a big, huge Ungus conch shell. You might've seen it before, but you might not have known that this was once an animal's home. So this is just the outside shell that the animal lived in, but once upon a time, there was an animal that lived inside here and it would have like a foot that would stick out <laughs> and um, they're pretty cool. So it would have a foot that would stick out and this would kind of glide along the ocean floor looking for its food and whatnot. But shells like this that you find, the animal obviously is no longer inside. Um, and it's also really important if you find different animals at the beach, you have to make sure that no one's inside. Like this little lightning whelk, no one was in there, no one was home. So I was able to take this shell home from the beach. Now, if I would have looked inside and this was closed like a little trap door, then I would know the animal's still living. So I would set it nicely back down in the ocean so it could keep going. And let's see, what else do I have? I have a shell that I found. Now this one is kind of clamped close, but I know no one's home. It's um, definitely hollow, but I found this one in Florida. 
And so once again, there's like a little muscle or a clam that used to live inside. And let's see, do, 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 do. All right, this one is very special. This is an example of a horseshoe crab. These are a little harder to find and they're really fragile. So it's hard to find one that's um, dead and dried up on the beach that isn't damaged. But this little horseshoe crab would glide along underneath the water and it would be partially covered by the sand and it would be really hard to see because his color met, blends in with that sand. He's really camouflaged. But if you look underneath, you can see that he uses those little legs to walk along the bottom of the ocean. All right, and my last little specimens are starfish. So once again, these are not living anymore, but these once were living things. So just like the other shells, these are the skeletons or the leftovers of those living things. So if you ever find a starfish in the wild, it's really important that you leave it there. Right now they're very brittle and they're hard, but when they were alive, they would move and kind of wiggle um, and they're kind of slow moving um, fish, but they definitely are alive. So I'll flip them over so you can see where their mouths are. This one's a little easier to see. That hole in the middle would be his mouth. And once upon a time when he was alive, he would have little tiny tentacles that would help him move along the bottom of the ocean looking for his food. And once again, this is an animal that could blend in with the sand. So that is all I have. Oh, one more. All right, sand dollars. Sand dollars are super cool. I found a ton of these in Florida. Um, and these are the same thing. They are the shell or the skeleton of a once living animal. And you can see underneath is the mouth. So whenever you find sand dollars at the beach, please leave them there. They are protected and you could even have a big fine to pay if you take them. So these ones were taken when they were either already dead or purchased from a store, but not caught in the wild. All right. Thank you so much. I hope you have fun and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Ms. Schramm. Uh, the question is, what are some animals, why are some animals useful to the soil? Soil animals have an important role in the formation of soil structure. Soil animals improve soil structure by forming channels and pores, concentrating fine soil particles together into aggregates and by fragmenting and mixing organic matter throughout the soil. Thank you again, Ms. Ram. Now I'm going to share my screen. During this virtual field trip, students explored how soils were formed by weathering of rock and decomposition of plant and animal remains. Mr. Monroe discussed weathering of rock, decomposition of plants and animals by Ms. Ramirez. Mr. Dominguez covered compost bins, and Ms. Ram told you all about animals in soil. Thank you for joining us. Teachers, if you would, go to www.tiny.cc slash 3-5 feedback fill out a very short form and send it to us. Thank you again for joining us. Have a great day. More importantly, have a great life.